Theater on the Air. Columbia Broadcasting System brings you the 15th program in its weekly dramatic series featuring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air, the brilliant producing company which has been acclaimed by critics throughout the nation for giving to radio the same new stimulus they brought to Broadway. This evening, our play is an adaptation of a modern classic, Booth Tarkington 17, with Orson Welles in the part of William Sylvanus Baxter. But first, a word from the director of the Mercury Theater, the writer, star, and producer of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. No man can explain the mystery and misery of being 17, that period which is almost a full stop in the involved sentence of a man's life, when every man's universe has growing pains and every man is his own hamlet. Booth Tarkington has left us a perspective of this sharp condition of human agony, so true and brutal and beguiling that posterity will understand William Sylvanus Baxter long after a new and easy world has forever abolished the institution of adolescence. <laughs> My name's Parcher, Henry Parcher. I live on Maple Street, number 42. Wife and one daughter, May, 18 years old. On one side of us is Doc Watson's house, vacant now. On the other is George Baxter's, Mr. and Mrs. and two children. Little girl, about 10, I forget her name. Boy Willie, 17. Just now we've got a visitor, a friend of May's, staying with us. Lola Pratt. Talks baby talk. Well, I guess we can stand it for a weekend. Anyway, the young folks don't stay around the house these days. In this town, they spend most of their time at the Main Street Pharmacy. Hi, Ray. Hello, everybody. Hello, man. How's the Oh, nothing new. Town's dead. Well, Mr. Baxter, what'll it be? Make it a banana split, Ray. Yours, Mr. Bullet? Same. Wow. The boys must be flesh today. Oh, we got enough. Let me call you sweetheart. Love. Always love. Why can't songwriters write something about something else? Hmm. They uh-huh. will. I heard Nate Parcher is coming back to town yesterday. Well, I'll let her for all I care. Well, they say she's brought a girl to visit her. Said she was a regular ring dinger. Oh, what if she is? Makes little difference to me, I guess. Oh, no, it don't. You don't take any interest in girls. Oh, no. No, I do not. I never saw one in my life. I cared whether she lived or died. Honest? Honest? Is that so? Yeah, honest. I could all die. I wouldn't notice. Boy, I didn't know you felt that way about it, Will. I always thought you were kind well, of... Well... I do feel that way about him. You can tell him so for me if you want to. Say, but you look what's walking down the street. <whistles> Isn't that me, Parcher? Yeah. Say, who's that with her? Carrying the parasol and the little dog. Well, that must be the girl. Isn't she a ring dinger? <whistles> hey, Will! Joe, don't you want your splits? To my lady with the little dog. I do not know her name, 
Though it would be the same Where roses bloom at twilight And the lark takes his flight So I will call her Milady By the sands of the sea She will always be Just Milady to me William Sylvanus Baxter, Esquire, July 14th. Willie, Willie. Ye gods. Willie, Mama wants you. Ah, go away, Jane. Willie, Willie. What do you want? Willie, Mama wants you. Wants you to go home again and just bring some more tubs home. And a tin clothes bottle from the second hand man store. What? She wants you to hurry. And I got some bread and butter and applesauce and sugar for coming to tell you. Oh, go away, will you, Jane? Go Willie. on. Willie. Willie, open the door, please. All right, Mother. Carry wash tubs. That's a nice thing to ask me to do. Ye gods, you think Joe Bullitt's mother had dared to... Now, wait, dear. I just want to explain. Explain? Ye gods! Now, now, just a minute, Willie. What I wanted to explain was why it's necessary for you to go with Genesis... Mother, you expect me to walk through the public streets with that awful-looking old colored man? Well, Genesis isn't old, is he, Mama? He is so old. Besides, he's practically in rags, and he doesn't even wear an undershirt. Now, who on earth minds what Genesis wears or doesn't wear. Second hand wash tubs and tin clothes boilers. That's what you want your son to carry through the public streets in broad daylight. Ye gods. Well, there isn't anybody else. Now, please don't rave so, Willie, and don't say ye gods so much. It really isn't nice. Now, I'm sure nobody will notice Nobody. Yet. Oh, no. Nobody except the whole town. Why... Well, there's anything disgusting has to be done in this family. Why do I always have to be the one? Mother, why can't Genesis bring the second-hand wash tubs without me? Why can't the second-hand store deliver them? Why the can't... second-hand store doesn't deliver things. And Genesis says he can't possibly carry two tubs and a wash boiler himself. Now, I don't like to ask you, but it really isn't much. You and Genesis can just slip up there slip. and... Just slip up there. Ye God! Oh, really, Willie, it isn't worth your making all this fuss about. Oh, no, it's nothing. Nothing at all. And, Willie, dear, on your way downtown, you might tell the tailor to call for your father's full dress suit. He hasn't worn it in four months. It's too tight for him. Needs to be altered. Ye God! Do I have to do everything in this house? Ye God! Mama, what's the matter with Willie? Well, you see, dear... He's... he's 17. Oh, land sakes, Mr. William, watch out. You can't see where you're going with that tin boy over your head. I don't want to see, and I don't want to be seen. You sure his face will get run over. Let's carry the big tub between us like this, and you can guide me. Now, come on, Genesis. Roo, roo. Hey, is that money you're still following oh, us? It sure is. Clem never stopped following me yet. I reckon it's the foulest dog in the world. Well, he can... Oh, don't let him follow through the streets. Not a moth-eaten mongrel like that. It's bad enough to be seen carrying all this junk. Man, sakes, ain't nobody can tell who you are with that wash tub over your face. Genesis, make that dog scat, uh, Ain't please. nobody can make that dog scat. I ain't had it more than two weeks, but... I don't believe President of the United States make that dog quit following. Well, keep him as far back as you can so people won't know it's us he's following. Uh, go on, Clem. Roo. Stay Roo. back, dog. Hey, careful, Mr. William. He's crossing the street. You tell me if anything's coming. Oh, well, road's clear. Come on. All right. Where roses bloom at twilight And the lark takes his flight by the sands of the sea She'll always be... What makes you exciting this, will you? Oh, just something I made up. Oh, it sounds kind of like a poem. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Yes, oh, they see the funny laundry when see the stuff they see, too. No, they'll hear you. Hey, what's behind this? Oh, There's two young ladies. one got yellow hair and it's kind of pretty. <laughs> Can't funny little dog. Looks like a cat puller. Bet Clem could eat him in one swallow. Now, did that office must have dollar nickel rod. Now, if you got that little bird walking. Hurry, Genesis, hurry. Man, what you in such a rush for? I got plenty of time. How close are they, Genesis? And ladies? About 20 feet. M- Mr. Williams, stop pulling on this tub. My oh, handle's man. most walked through my hide. Holy, you better not let Floppet near that awful-looking dog. Oh, little dog better not mix with old man Clem. Doggy, must belong to Tommy Lawrence. 
Tell me, make such a sloppy. Hurry up. Oh, 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 oh,
Don't you think so? Mm -hmm. I think real love is sacred, don't you? Mm -hmm. Don't you think love is the most sacred thing there is? That is, if it's real love? Mm -hmm. I do. I, I'm glad you feel that like that because I think real love is the kind nobody could have but just once in their lives because... Because the real love a man feels for a girl and a girl for a man, if they really love each other, and you look at a case like that, of course they would both love each other. It wouldn't be real love. Well, what I say is, if it's real love, well, it's it's sacred, because I think that kind of love is always sacred. Don't you think love is sacred if it's the real thing? Here, Tickle Boy Baxter. Still flop it again. He flop it. He is flop it. <laughs> <laughs> longer, Mother. Until your hour is up. Now try it again. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, You've got to do three. something about that, child. I cannot stand it. Oh, you've been gone all morning, Willie. I thought your father mentioned at breakfast that he expected you to put in at least two hours a day on your geometry. That's neither here nor there. Mother, I just want to say this. If you don't want to do something about Jane, I will. Just look at her. I ask you, that's the way she looked half an hour ago out on the public sidewalk in front of the house when I came by here with Miss Pratt. That was pleasant, wasn't it, to be walking with a lady on the public street and meet a member of my family looking like that. Oh, lovely. Yes, now, Jane doesn't look so disreputable. Come, Willie, you're interrupting her piano lesson. Wait till I tell you the rest. Then she, she hollered at me, Mother. She hollered, oh, Willie. She hollered, oh, Willie, at me. Anybody'd think I was about six years old. She hollered, Oh, Willie, and she rubbed her stomach and flushed applesauce all over her face, and she kept hollering, Willie, with her mouth full. Willie, look, good bread and butter and applesauce and sugar. I bet you wish you had some. Willie! Well, you did eat some the other day. You ate a whole lot. You did every time she did. Now you hush up. She kept following us, Mother. She followed us, hollering, Willie. Still, it's a wonder we didn't go deep. And just look at her, Mother. I don't see how you can stand it to have her going around like that and people knowing it's your child. Why, she hasn't got enough on. <laughs> For this very hot weather, I really don't think people notice or care. Notice? About... I guess Miss Pratt noticed. Hot weather's no excuse for... for outright obesity. I ask you to look at her back. You can see her spinal cord. Column, spinal column, Willie. Well, what do I care, which is it? People aren't supposed to go around with it exposed, whichever it is, with applesauce on their ears. Well, there is not. Look, I just ask you to look. It, that's the sight I have to meet when I'm out walking with Miss Pratt. She asked me who, who it was, and... Mother, I wish you'd seen her face. She wanted to know who that curious child was, and I'm glad you didn't hear the way she said it. Who is that curious child, she said, and I had to tell her it was my sister. I had to tell Miss Pratt it was my only sister. Uh, Willie, who is Miss Pratt? I don't think I've ever heard Willie's of Willie's masked on her, and uh. she wears four side curls when almost came off. She's visiting Miss May Parcher, but the Parchers are awful tired of her. They wish she'd go home, but they don't like to tell her so. Now, if you don't punish her, it's because you've lost your sense of duty. Now, now, wait, Willie. Jane doesn't mean to hurt your feelings. My feelings? You stand there and allow her to speak as she did of one of the... Oh, the noblest. One of the noblest. Oh, Jane didn't mean anything. Now, don't get so upset about things, upset! Willie. Upset! Upset ye God! What made you say that? Where did you hear such things? Well, I was there. You were where, Jane? At the Parchers. Oh, I see. Yesterday afternoon, Miss Parcher had the Sunday school class for lemonade and cookies. Well, did you hear Miss Parcher no, say? No, I ate too many cookies, I guess, maybe. Anyways, Miss Parcher said I'd better lay down. Lie down? Yes, ma'am. On the sofa in the library. And Mrs. Parcher and Mr. Parcher came in there and sat down after a while. And it was kind of dark and they didn't hardly notice me. And Mr. Parcher said since Miss Pat came to visit, there wasn't anywhere he could go because Willie Baxter and Johnny Watson and Joe Bullitt and Miss Pratt were always arguing something about love. It made him just sick at the stomach. And he said Willie was the worst. What? And he said he couldn't sit even in the library, but he had to hear either Willie Baxter or Joe Bullitt or somebody or other arguing about love. 
he said, Mama. He said he couldn't stand those da- James, you mustn't say such things. Well, I said, Mama, Mr. Parker said it. He said you couldn't stand those James, da- no matter what he said, you mustn't repeat. But I'm not. I only said Mr. Parker said he couldn't stand those... But, da- Mama, how can I tell you what he said? And I thought... Hush. You must never, never use such a terrible and wicked word. I won't, Mama. Oh, I know I'll say word instead. Won't that be all right? I, I suppose so. Well, Mr. Parker said he couldn't stand those word boys. That sounds all right, doesn't it, Mama? I suppose so. Well, they kind of talked along. Mr. Parker said when he was young, he wasn't any such a, a word fool as these young word fools were. He said in all his born days, Willie Baxter was the wordest fool he ever saw. That was very unjust and very wrong of Mr. Parcher. Mrs. Parcher said he oughtn't to say word, Mama. She said, hush, hush to him, Mama. He talked like this, Mama. He said, I'll be worded if I stand it. And he kept getting crosser and crosser, and he said, word, word, word. There, there, that will do, Jane. We'll go on with your practicing. Now try that exercise again. One, two, three, four. One, two. Jabber, 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 jabber. On and on. That's the way these young folks talk. Same things over every night, like finger exercises. No sense, no rhyme, no reason. Just jabber, 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 jabber. Wonder what they find to talk about. Genesis. Genesis. I want to ask you something. What's that, Mr. Willie? Oh, seems like this ice cream ain't never going to freeze. Genesis, how old were you when you were married? Well, sir, I had three children when I was 20. I had two when I was 18. You did? Go away, Jane. Genesis, how old were you when you had the first one? I was just your age, Miss William. Yes, sir, I was 17. Well, Genesis... What became of the one that was born when you were 17? Well, Miss Willis, I, I never did know. Was it a boy or a girl? It seemed like it must have been a boy, Miss Jane. Well, did it die? Well, I think it must be dead by now. A good many of them dead. What I know is it's dead. Yes, my reckon so. Genesis, how old were you when you were married? Me? Well, sir, uh, that depends. I recollect I was married once in Louisville... Well, well, I, I I heard of people getting married even younger than you were. Yeah, you take India, for instance. Why, they get married in India when they're 12 and even 7 and 8 years old. Oh, they do not. The mothers and fathers wouldn't let them, and they wouldn't want to anyway. I suppose you've been to India and know all about it. Well, as a matter of that, there was a young couple got married in Pennsylvania the other day. The girl was only 15, and the man was 16. It was in the papers, and they're... Parents consented and said it was a good thing. And there was a case in Fall River, Massachusetts, where the young man, 18 years old, married a woman, 41 years old. It was in the papers, too. And I heard of another case somewhere in Iowa. A boy began shaving when he was 13 and shaved every day for four years. Now he's got a full beard and he's going to get married this year because he's 18 years old. And Joe Bullock's got a cousin in Iowa that knows about this case. He knows the girl this fellow with the beard's going to marry and... He says he expects it'll turn out the best thing could have happened. And right here in our own county, there were 11 couples married in the last six months under 21 years of age. My goodness, I collect all them facts, Miss Willie. Land name. What puzzles me is how you remember them if you didn't collect them. If it was me now, I couldn't collect them in the first place, and even if I could, it wouldn't be no good to me because I couldn't recollect them. Well, it isn't so hard if you kind of get the hang of it, Genesis. I... Always did have a pretty good memory. Oh, Mama says you're the most forgetful boy she ever heard of. Said you can't remember anything two minutes. Oh, you hush. Genesis, do you remember when you were married? Genesis? Genesis, how'd you feel about it? I mean, were you sort of shaky, for instance? As if you were taking an important step in life? Let me see, huh? I thought my shaky once, I recollect. Uh, that time a man started shooting at me from behind a snake fence. Shooting at you, Mr. Genesis? 
What'd you do that for? Nothing. Nothing the wide world. Bound to shoot at somebody, and they pick on me because I was the handest. Well, ice cream and all fresh. Like I better throw it in the kitchen. He must have been 16. When, Willie? When he was married. Things you don't understand. You run in the house. Go on, Jane. Go on. <laughs> Between Willie Baxter, Lola Pratt, and the heat, I'm slowly losing my reason. This morning, I discovered my tobacco box behind a bench in the backyard. When I took the lid off the box, I found a faded rose, a girl's silver shoe buckle, a tortoiseshell hairpin, white ribbon faintly smelling of violets, three withered four-leaf clover, clovers, other vegetation now indistinguishable, and a note on lavender paper addressed to Ickle Boy Baxter. What ickle sanity I still have left, I owe to the sudden appearance this evening of a small, frank-faced child munching on a piece of bread and butter, applesauce, and powdered sugar. Mr. Parcher! Uh, Mr. Parcher! Good afternoon, Mr. Parcher. Good afternoon. Mr. Parcher, my brother Willie's been at your house all afternoon. I suppose so. Listen, Mr. Parcher, my brother Willie isn't coming back to your house tonight, but he doesn't know it yet. What? Well, he isn't going to spend any more evenings at your house at all. He isn't, but he doesn't know it yet. Are you sure he isn't? I know he isn't. It's on account of something I told Mama. Uh, told your Mama what? What you said. And hey, what about? About Willie, you know. No, I don't. It was when I was laying in the library that day of the Sunday school class. You and Mrs. Parcher was talking in there about Miss Pratt and Willie and everything. Good heavens, did you hear all that? Yes, I told Mama all what you said. Murder. Well, I guess it's good I did, because look, that's the very reason Mama did something, so he can't come anymore except in daytime. Hmm, but he hasn't found out yet. Uh, found out what, please? He hasn't found out he can't come back to your house tonight, nor tomorrow night, nor day after tomorrow night. Is it because your Mama's going to tell him he can't? No, Mr. Parcher, she just did something. Huh, what? What'd she do? Well, it's a secret. Oh, I could tell you the first part of it up to where the secret begins, I expect. Do. Well, it's about something Willie's been wearing. I can't tell you what you were because, well, that's the secret. But he had them on him every evening when he came to see Miss Pratt. They belong to Papa, and Papa doesn't know a word about it. Yeah, I thought he didn't. Well, one evening Papa wanted to put them on. Mama couldn't find them. And she rummaged and rummaged and never did find them. Until, don't you believe, I saw Willie inside of him only last night. So I told Mama, and she said it had to be a secret. So that's why I can't tell you what they were. Well, this afternoon, I was with her in Willie's room and... Yes, yes. So there she found them under Willie's window seat, all folded up. You found what? Well, I told you it's a secret. Oh. So she wrapped the secret up and we took it to a tailor. And she told him to make it bigger because then it'll fit pop again, Mr. Patcher. She said he must let the secret way, way out. So I guess Willie looked kind of funny in it after it's fixed. And anyway, Mr. Parcher, the secret won't be home from the tailors for two weeks, and maybe by, by that time Miss Pratt will be gone. Do you honestly think well, so? Anyway, Mr. Parcher, Mama said, well, she said she's sure Willie wouldn't come here in the evening anymore. When you're home, Mr. Parcher, after you've been wearing the secret every night this way, you wouldn't like to come and not have the secret on. I suppose that's what you meant when you said he wasn't coming back, but uh, didn't know it yet. Oh, yes, Mr. Parcher. I um, know your last name, of course, but I'm afraid I've forgotten your other one. Uh... Well, it's Jane. Jane. Jane, I should like to do something for you. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Parcher. Well, I guess we're from home now. Well, goodbye, Mr. Parcher. Goodbye, Jane. <clears throat> I'm afraid little Jane has her first bow. A gentleman is going to send her a five-pound box of candy, and uh, <clears throat> that gentleman's name is Henry Parcher. are listening to a CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in an original adaptation of Booth Tarkington 17. The performance will continue after a brief intermission. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
we've got still a new boarder at the Parcher house. Beside Lola Pratt and her usual string, there's Joe Bullitt's cousin George from out of town. George has an excellent appetite. He's going out today with a crowd on a picnic. Well, we'll have one meal in peace. Pickles. Say, who's hiding the gravy? Joe just wants the fork. Got an extra fork, anybody? Oh, uh, somebody lost his girlfriend. Hey, has anybody seen Willie Baxter's girl? Yeah, you think Willie was at a funeral? Ah, uh-huh. hush your mouth. Joe Bullard looks kind of sick, too. What you voting for, Joe? Oh, stop teasing him, boy. Hey, why aren't you sitting next to Lola, Willie? Ah, oh, dry up, will you? She looks kind of occupied. Joe Cousins rushing her. Pass the chicken, will you, Manny? You've had three helpings already. Why aren't you eating, Willie? Oh, because I'm not hungry, that's why. Me, I can't keep up with Joe's cousin. Look at that George eat. What did you have to invite the big lummox for, Joe? Well, how does I know George was going to hog Lola and eat his fool head off? Oh, look at that goop. I tell you, I'm going to... Stop it, want to snuggle, Jay, big man? Oh. Want to hold it just like that, Uncle George? Oh. Why, you bet I do, Lola. <laughs> Dogs are always crazy about me. Dogs and children... I don't know why it is, but they just take right to little Georgie. Flop it looks so toot and cunning on Drake Ignormous Man's lap. <laughs> well, he does look kind of small compared with good old George. Well, I always was a good deal bigger than the fellas I went with. I don't know why it is, but I was always kind of quicker, too, as it were. Take me in an automobile now, I... Got a racing car home. Oh, Georgia can drive like great big racing man. Lola, I'd like to have you see how I handle that little racing car. <laughs> Girls over home, they say they like to go out with me just to watch the way I handle it. They say it ain't so much just the ride, but more the way I handle that little car. Yes, I don't know why it is, but that's what to say. Oh, pass me more potatoes, Lola. Ooh, Echo, stop it. Watch Uncle Georgia can eat enormous dinner. Why, uh, you haven't seen the start. Hey, here, don't take out that pie. I'll finish the platter. Oh, look, precious, stop it. I'm glad that George eats three pieces of pie. And two Georgie come. Well, I only wish I had something to top it off with, like champagne or ice cream. How'd you like a smoke, George? Oh, yeah. say, I don't smoke papers and old carpets. Not me. Oh, but cigarettes so lovely smell. Uncle George made a too little boy for smoking. Oh, now it's not that, Lola. I, uh, I, I only smoke cigars. Cigars? Oh, splendid. Light one, Uncle George. Light one ever and ever so quick. Oh, well, uh, yeah, I forgot my cigar case. Hey, George, here's some cigars. Cuban sweetheart. Oh, Cuban sweetheart. Sloppy, just think. Cuban sweetheart. Uh, thanks, Baxter. Light Sorry. one. Light one. Look, everybody. Great big man can't be happy unless he have a tobacco smoke. Light it, Georgieson. <coughs> oh, boy, that's good. That's the old... <coughs> Stop. That's what I was looking for. Watch, everybody. Now, Georgieson... Great big enormous puff. That's it. Now, another one. Another one. Sure. These are... <coughs> These are fine. Another one, Georgica. Great big enormous puff. Puff hard, Georgica. Another one. Uh, just a second, I... I... Don't stop, Georgica. Make great big puff for precious drop it. But I can't. I guess I'd better go outside for a minute. Just a minute. <laughs> What's wrong with George? Is he sick? See how pale he got? Come on, Willie. we got to take care of him. Maybe he needs a doctor. Ah, oh, you take care of him. <laughs> the big lummox is your cousin. Echo boy Baxter. Yes, Lola? Come here. You don't ever talk to little Lola. So indifferent today. Well, Lola, and she was I. Uh, then let's talk about it. Here, take precious Flop it. Hold him nice and cozy. Flop it, love, old friend, best. Don't you, precious? Flop it, love, little boy, that's still better than anyone else. Don't you, Flop it. Well, I 
guess the happy day's in sight. Saturday night, we're giving a farewell party at the Parcher household for Lola Pratt, our weekend guest, who stayed for the summer. Never has a party meant so much to me as this one. Farewell party, farewell Lola, farewell silly boys, mixed quartets, farewell Willie Baxter, farewell party. Father. Yes, Willie? Dear me, Willie, you do look pale. You better rest up for the party Saturday. Father. Uh, Father. I suppose you got Miss Pratt safely home from church. Hmm. <laughs> She might have been carried off by footpads if you three boys hadn't been along to take care of her, huh? Father, I have come to, uh... What on earth's the matter with you? Father, I have come... I have come to place before you something I think it's your duty as my father to undertake. And I have thought over this step before laying it before you. My soul, my soul. At my age, there's some things that ought to be done and some things that ought not to be done. If you ask me what I thought ought to be done, there's only one answer. When anybody as old as I am has to go out among other young men his own age that already got one, like anyway half of them have, who I go with, and their fathers have already taken such a step because they felt it was the only right thing to do, because at my age and the young men I go with's age, it is the only right thing to do because... That is something nobody could deny. At my age, I have thought over this step because there comes a time to every young man when they must lay a step before their father before something happens that they would be sorry for. I have thought this undertaking over, and I am certain it would be your honest duty... My soul. I thought I knew you pretty well, but you talk like a stranger to me. Now, what's all this? What do you want? A dress suit. A dress suit? Well, I'm glad you're talking about something, because I honestly thought it must be too much fun. Father, I got to have one. Got to? Hm. At your age, I thought I was lucky if I had any suit that was fit to be seen in. You're too young, Willie. I don't want you to get a, anything like that on such stuff on your mind, and if I have to if I have my way, you won't have a dress suit for four years more, anyhow. Father, I got to have one. I got to have one right away. I don't ask you to have it made or to go to expensive tailors, but there's plenty of good ready-made ones that only cost about $40. They're advertised in the paper. Father, Father, wouldn't you spend just $40? I'll pay it back when I'm in business. I'll work. Not the money, son. It's the principle that I'm standing for, and I don't intend. Father, won't you do it? No, I will not. Oh, ye gods! Poor boy, he won't feel like going to the party in his everyday clothes. Poor boy, nothing. Think of his coming out here and starting a regular debating society declamation before his mother and father. <laughs> I guess he can wear the kind of clothes most of the other boys wear. What's the world getting to be like? Seventeen years old and throws a fit because he can't have a dress suit. Why, Willie, dear, you look worn out. What's the matter? Mother, I want to speak to you. Well, first you better eat your supper. I left it on the table. I want to speak to you about something important. Yes, Willie? Oh, please send Jane away. I can't talk about important things with a child in the room. Oh, Mama, do I have to go? Just a few minutes, dear. Mother. Hmm? Mother, I want to ask you please to lend me three dollars and sixty cents. What for, Willie? Mother, I just ask you to lend me three dollars and sixty cents. But what for? Mother, I don't feel I can discuss it any. I simply ask you, will you lend me three dollars and sixty cents? I don't think I could, Willie, but it's certainly I should want to know what for. Mother, I am going on eighteen years of age, and when I ask for a small sum of money like three dollars and sixty cents, I think I might be trusted to know how to use it for my own good without having to answer questions like a child. And after all, I don't think I ought to, dear, and I'm sure your father would wouldn't wish me to unless you tell me what you want it for. You won't do it. Well, you see, dear, oh. I'm afraid the reason you don't tell me is because you know that I wouldn't give it to you if I knew what you wanted it for. Now, sit down and eat your supper. You mustn't be late to the party. But, well, Willie, where are you going? I don't want any supper, and I'm not going to the party. Well, of all things. Oh, Mama. Yes, Jane. 
I was hiding behind the door so I could hear everything. Now, Jane, you know you shouldn't do that. But, Mom, I had to. I know why Willie asked you for the money. Genesis told me. Jane, what did Genesis tell you? First of all, Willie didn't come home today because he was counting knot holes and shingles. He was what? Yes, ma'am. Genesis knows all about it. This lumberyard man got into some kind of a fuss because he had bought millions and millions of shingles, Mama, that had too many knots in. And the man don't want to pay for them. Or else the store he bought them won't take him back. And they got to prove how many shingles are bad shingles or something. And anyway, Mama, that's what Willie's doing. Every time he comes to a bad shingle, Mama, he puts it somewhere else. And every time he puts a thousand bad shingles in this other place, they give him six cents. Good gracious. Oh, but that's nothing, Mama. Just wait till you hear the rest. That part of it isn't anything at all, Mama. You wouldn't hardly notice that part of it if you knew the other part of it, Mama. Jane. Yes, ma'am? I want to know everything Genesis told you, and I want you to tell it as quickly as you can. Well, I am telling it, Mama. I'm just beginning to tell it. I can't tell it unless there's a beginning, can I? Try your best to go on, Jane. Yes, ma'am. Well, Willie needed some money bad, and you and Papa wouldn't get many. And so he began counting shingles today, because tonight's his night of a party, and he just has to have it. Well, how did Genesis know that? Did Willie tell Genesis? Listen, Mama. Genesis knows all about a second-hand store over on the Avenue, and it keeps most everything. And Genesis says it's the nicest store. And Genesis says this man is the bargainest man in the whole wide world, Mama. Well, and so this man's name is One-Eyed Belgis, Mama. That's his name, and Genesis says so. One eyed Bell just told Genesis that Willie came in there and tried on the coat of one of those waiter suits. Oh, no. Yes, ma'am. And One eyed Bell just told Willie that suit was worth $14. And Willie said he didn't have any money. Well, and so they bargained and bargained and bargained. And then after they bargained and bargained, One eyed Bell just said Willie should give him $3.60 for Willie to pay before he'd get the suit. Well, and so the worst part of it is. Genesis says the suit is haunted. What? Yes, and Genesis says that suit is haunted. Genesis, everybody over on the avenue knows all about that suit. And he says that that's why one-eyed Belgis could never sell it before. Genesis says one-eyed Belgis tried to sell it to a colored man for $3. The man said he wouldn't put it on for $300. And Genesis says he wouldn't either because it, be- it belonged to a waiter that, that... Mama, this waiter, he lived over on the avenue. And he took a case knife he sharpened, and he cut off a lady's head with it. Oh, oh. And he got hung, Mama. If you don't believe it, you can ask One-Eyed Belgis. I guess he knows. Hush, and, you just, hush. And, and he sold this suit to One-Eyed Belgis when he was in jail, Mama. He sold it to him before he got hung, Mama. Hush, Jane. And he had that suit on when he cut the lady's head off, Mama. And that's why it's haunted. They cleaned it all up except for a few little spots of... Jane! Death. You must not talk about such things. And Genesis mustn't tell you stories of that sort. Well, how could he help it if he told me about Willie? Never mind. Did that crazy child... Did Willie bring that suit into this house? Yes, Mama. Well, I'm going right down to Mr. Belgis's. He'll turn back Willie's money or I'll have him arrested. Arrested? Mama, can I go along? No, no. You stay here and finish the dishes. Oh, dear. Jane. Jane, yesterday I... I took your Papa's evening clothes back to the tailor to get them pressed and, uh... Well, I... I guess he must have misunderstood because uh, he took them way in again, and now they're much too tight for Papa. They uh, they just about fit Willie, I guess. So uh, there they are, hanging in the hall closet upstairs, all pressed. But uh, don't tell anyone what I said, Jane. Oh no, Mama. Willie. Oh, Willie. <laughs> Magic lanterns, music, summer night, farewell party, farewell summer, farewell Lola Pratt, farewell Lola Pratt. Lola, 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 I gotta have a dance. Yeah, I got her, Lola. The cowboy Buster naughty. Come later, Lola's oh, Lola. Lola. Lola's little dance part all filled up. I couldn't help it, Lola. Honest, I couldn't. Honest. Sorry. Lola promised boy comes all her dances. Oh, oh, listen just a second, Lola. Say, hey, Lola, please. Lola must go. Boy comes way to play little partner. Hey, Johnny. Johnny. You look here, Johnny. Uh, and Joe, you listen to you both got seven dances apiece with her. All on account of my getting here early enough and... Listen, you got it. Well, it wasn't because of any such reason. I... 
I asked her for mine two days well, ago. Well, that wasn't fair, was it? Just because I never thought of sneaking in ahead like that, you go and Well, stick... you ought to have thought of it. I can't stand here gabbing all night. Joe, Joe, I've done a good many favors for well, you. I've got to go and see a man. Now, let me go, Willie. Oh, Joe. Uh, somebody i got to see right away before the next dance begins. Honest, I have. Well, he got... Can't you wait a minute? you got to give me anyway two out of all the dances, whether you... You heard her tell me yourself that she'd be willing if you were Johnny well, or... Well, I only got five or six with her and a couple of extras. Johnny's got seven. Listen, now, Joe. Joe, listen. If I'd got six regular and two extras with Miss Pratt last night and you got here late and it, it wasn't your fault, I couldn't help being late, could I? It wasn't my fault I was late, I guess, was it? Well, if I was in your place, I wouldn't act the way you and Johnny do. Not in a thousand years, I wouldn't. I'd say, you want a couple of my dances with Miss Pratt, old man? Why, certainly. Yes, you would. Well, now, look here, Joe. Don't you realize this is the very last night of Miss Pratt's going to be in this town? Well, you bet I do. Joe. Joe, you and I have been friends ever since you and I were boys. Well, when I look back, I expect I've done more favors for you than for anyone else, Bill, Joe. Bill, there's other girls here you can get dances with. There's one or two of them sitting around the yard. Oh. You can have a bully time, even if you did come late. Joe. Joe, you've got to give me anyway one. Look, look. Sitting yonder over under that tree all by herself. That, that's a visiting girl named Miss Boat. Oh, well, Miss... She's a little fat, but, well, I bet she's a good dancer. Miss. Nate Parcher says so. She was trying to get me to dance with her myself, but I couldn't, or I wouldn't, or I would have. No, 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 no wait. I, I gotta go, Bill. I no. got to. No, wait just a minute. Oh, no, I, I gotta... gotta go. I got to... Hey! Oh, no, Hey! <laughs> hey, Mother. Yes, dear? Look at that Baxter boy. Must have got hold of his father's dress suit again. Now, how do you know it's his father? That's a secret between Miss Jane Baxter and myself. Say, that boy's face has more genuine idiocy in it than I've seen around here yet. And I've been seeing some miracles in that line this summer. She's looking at Lola Pratt. Yeah, that's the trouble with him. Why doesn't he quit looking at her? I think probably he feels badly because she's dancing with one of the other boys. Of course, he ought to be dancing with somebody. There are one or two more girls here than boys. He's the only boy not dancing. I believe I'll... Good evening, William. Good evening, ma'am. Don't you want to dance? Ma'am? Don't you want to dance? Have you looked around for a girl without a partner? Uh, girl? You come with me. I'll fix you up. But, uh, uh ma'am, I go... <laughs> Miss Boak, this is Mr. Baxter. He and you both came late, dear, and he hasn't any dances and gays either. So run and dance and have a nice time together. Well, Miss Boak. May I have this dance with you, Miss Boak? Sorry, please, too. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> be discouraged with yourself, Mr. Baxter. Uh, you know, I've met lots of men that had trouble to get started and turned out to be right good dancers after all. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, uh, well, it seems to me we're kind of working against uh, each other. Uh, 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 I'll tell you, you kind of let me do the guiding and I'll get you going fine. Uh, no, no. Uh, one, two, one, two. There. Oh, I just love dancing, don't you, Mr. Baxter? What? Uh, yeah. It's a beautiful floor for dancing, isn't it? Yeah. I just love dancing. Don't you love it, Mr. Baxter? Yeah. It's lovely. Oh, dear, I hope they don't play Home Sweet Home very early at parties in this town. No, I could I keep am. on like this all night. <laughs> I think those musicians would be dead. Well, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's go out on the porch, Mr. Baxter. All right. All right. Oh, just look at those stars. Aren't they just glorious? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can sit closer. Come over here. <laughs> you know... 
We used to dance a lot up at the lake. It's a floor like this is tonight. Just about early enough and as nice a floor as I ever danced on. Of course, there weren't so many men like this here tonight, and I must say I am glad to dance with a man again. <laughs> My, what a shindig, Mother. Genesis adds just the right touch with that waiter's uniform. <laughs> I'll bet it's borrowed, too. Well, everyone's having a grand time except that Baxter boy. I've been watching him all evening, and I never saw true misery show plainer. By George, I've begun to feel sorry for him. Can't you trot up someone else so we can get away from that fat girl? I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried. Well, do something. We don't want to find him in the cistern in the morning. I know. I'll make May and Lola and their partners come and sit in this little circle of chairs here. Then I'll go and bring Willie and Miss Boat to sit with them. I'll give Willie the seat at Lola's left. You keep the chairs and tell Genesis to get busy with the sandwiches. <laughs> Naughty ickle boy Baxter. Lola's last night in ickle boy Baxter flirting. Flirt all night with Dray Big Girl. Now, Lola. Lola, if you'd let me explain, Lola. Lola saw. Lola saw that uh, boy Baxter under Dray Big Tree flirting with Dray Big Girl. Lola. Flirting all night with Dray Big Norma Stewart. Lola, it wasn't. Oh, Charles? Oh. It wasn't my fault about dancing. Bad boy. What made you come to me? Who be so Charles Dolliver to talk to nice men who glad to talk to her? Lola. Oh, Lola. Naughty boy, back to troll. I dance with Josie Rosie. Come on, Josie. Let's get started, Mr. Baxter, before the floor gets crowded. Don't let's waste a single moment. You know, when I meet a person who steps fits in with mine the way yours does, Mr. Baxter, I love to dance straight through the evening with one Dearest Lola, just after you left, I went up to my room and began writing this poem to you. Lola, I want you to keep it with you always. The sunset light fades into night, but ne'er will I forget the smile that haunts me yet. What? Her name's Rennie Kirsten. She just moved to Mr. Watson's house next door. Oh, what do I care? Let me alone. Jane, who's that? It's Willie. Is he your papa? No, it's Willie. Yes, Rennie, let's play father the leader. You do everything I do. Come on, you run after me. The smile that haunts me still, whate'er my name and station, whilst receiving my education, though far away you seem, I will see thee in my dream. Like this. Now walk with it all out of joint. I'm walking. Look, my stomach. Jane. What? Stop that putting your stomach out in front of you like that. It's disgraceful. Why doesn't he like it, James? Oh, I don't know. He doesn't like much of anything. Come on, sit out your stomach again. I will see thee in a dream. Signed, William Baxter. Darling, when you read this poem, you'll really understand me. And remember, I shall be your echo boy Baxter always and always. Just for you. That is your father in the window, isn't it, Jane? No, I told you five times it's my brother, Willie. That's kind of crazy. That's because he's in love with Miss Pratt. She just went home after Mr. Parker pretty near died. She stayed so long. I'll see to you. Oh, run, Ready. He's coming after us. Run. I won't run. Not for him. I'll stay right here. You get out of here, hear me? You get out of here. I won't. I won't. You can't force me. You're only Willie. Why, you... You ugly, sooty, very big tail little girl... <laughs> yes, 
Asher. That's what he called her. I was standing on the porch at the time, and I heard it with my own ears. Well, sir, that was a long time ago. Ten years since the Kersteds moved in Doc Watson's house next door. A lot of strange things happened in ten years. For instance, you'd never believe it when I tell you Willie Baxter, age 27, is finally doing a sensible thing. He's doing the only sensible thing he ever did in his life. Yes, sir, he's doing it right this minute, over at the Stolen Church on Grove Street. He's standing kind of straight, his head up, at the end of a long aisle. There's a fine-looking girl got hold of his arm. Uh, Ranny's not got pigtails anymore. But she's still got good sense. And that's something Willie can count on for the rest of his life. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to 17. Not the celebrated stage play but the Mercury Theater's own adaptation of the Booth Tarkington story. Tonight, the cast included Ray Collins as Mr. Pacha. Ray Collins, one of the Mercury's unstarred stars, and Mary Wicks, another, as Mrs. Pacha. Joseph Cotton as Genesis. Betty Gard as Mrs. Baxter. Ruth Ford as the baby talk girl. Marilyn Erskine as Jane, Elliot Reed as Cousin George, and Patty Chapman as Ranny. William Sylvanus Baxter was probably all too recognizable. And finally, because the mercury is often inclined that way and sometimes can't help it, and chiefly because he was kind enough to be party to this moment of good old-fashioned theater sentiment, Joe Bullitt... William Baxter's best friend, was played again tonight by one of the Mercury Theater's foremost and finest actors, Mr. Morgan Farley, who created the part in the stage play. Next week, inevitably, and because it's about time, Mr. Jules Verne's immortal romance about the man who kept his word, who watched the clock and lived up to it. Phineas Fogg, Passepartout, the beautiful Indian princess, and a thousand other highly recognizable characters who I'm sure you've already identified with around the world in 80 days. Good night. <laughs> Mercury Theatre broadcast, the orchestra was conducted by Bernard Herman, and Davidson Taylor supervised the production for CBS. This is Dan Seymour speaking. We invite you again to listen next week to Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the air in Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.